Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is, I think, my sixth time. We, we, I can't remember one of them. I'm getting old. Uh, but at least fifth time, if not my sixth time in Exeter. Uh, I think two of my most viewed lecture, uh, talks ever were actually delivered here in, uh, in Exeter a long time ago. So it's been, uh, it's been uh, probably 10 years. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's great to, great to be back. Thank you guys for facilitating this and making it happen. Um, uh, this is great. Let me, before I get started, let me uh, just say the Einstein Institute has a conference this weekend um, in London, uh, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. Um, you can register for it, just kind of Google. Uh, it, we had flyers, I'm not sure where they are, but uh, just Google Ayn Rand Conference London 2022 and you'll find it. You can register if you'd like to come out. The train ride's not bad. I've done it now six times, um, back and forth. So today we're talking about capitalism and war. And I think the best way to start this is to acknowledge something or to recognize something that is really, really important. And it is kind of self-evident. And if it's not self-evident, you can watch TV and you can see it. And that is the war is horrific. It is evil. It is destructive. It is everything those of us who believe in freedom, who believe in liberty, are against. It is, a, it is a, not a zero-sum game, if you will. It's not a game. It's a negative-sum activity. There are no winners in a war, certainly not from an economic perspective. Everybody loses. The left often claims that wars result in economic activity. We should be the one calling them on it. That is just not true. World War II did not result in a boom. We would be much richer if that war would have never happened. Wars are destructive. They destroy on both sides, the winners and the losers. And it is, in human activity, a last resort. Maybe we, we could talk about when they are justified. But as a principle, the initiation of war is never justified. It is an unmitigated evil because it destroys the thing most precious. What's the thing most precious? Human life. Life. Human life. Standard of value, a standard for the good, should be human life, human flourishing, human success, human well-being. Wars destroy that. Not only do they kill large numbers of people and thus end life, the people who survive, whether they are injured or traumatized or have lost loved ones, in every part of life, this is devastating. Generations are traumatized by this. This is not something that goes away very easily. I, and, you know, if I can share personal experience, you know, I've lived through wars. Uh, I remember when I was 12, uh, 1973, we were, it was Yom Kippur, if you know, uh, the, the, the high Jewish holiday. We were in synagogue fasting, and suddenly the sirens go off. And soon after that, somebody comes and calls my dad, and off he goes. And we don't see him for weeks. And this is the beginning of the 1973 war uh, with uh, Syria and Egypt. I was 12. I was the oldest male in, a, in the apartment building. I had a one-week-old sister. And one of the things we would do is we would look in the afternoon. You would look out the window to see the cars coming up with a soldier with flowers and which house were they going to go to to tell somebody their loved one has died, right? War is an unmitigated evil. It is never good. For those who, on the right and on the left, valorize war, you know, valorize muscle, valorize force, think this is noble and good, you know, no words can describe how evil and awful that is. There's nothing noble about a war. You have to defend yourself sometimes. But that's still <laughs> not a pleasant activity, even if it has to be done. Wars are evil because they hurt human life. They destroy an economy. They destroy 
all the wealth that is being built. I mean, look at some of these cities in Ukraine now, this uh, city in the southeast of Ukraine, M Mary Pyol, I'm probably distorting the name. I mean, it's just been flattened. I mean, this was a thriving city of half a million people. And there are no buildings there. All that wealth, all that wealth creation, all that activity, all that vibrant economic activity that many of us know is win-win, that trading that went on, right? The production, the consumption, the trade, that win-win, that's all destroyed. And the only way to build it up again is to deploy capital that is now not going to go for something that could have been above and beyond. Now it's just to get us back to where we were before. So there's no, there's no perspective in which this is a good thing. So I think the question we must ask is given that it is so destructive and evil and harmful and really, really bad for everybody involved, why are we still seeing it? And why are we still seeing it of all places in Europe? Why are we seeing it in what we associate with civilization, with peace, with flourishing, with societies that supposedly care about human life. Why has war not died? We thought it was, you know, uh, uh, famously President Wilson declared the World War I to be the end of all war. It was so horrific. World War I was so horrific. So many people died. For what? What was the cause of World War I? What was the what was the reason to go to war? Nobody really knows, right? Uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire wanting to sustain its whatever, and the British feeling a little, you know, insecure, and the G Germans rising because they, oh, I don't know. But it's, none of it sounds really good as an excuse for why millions of people had to die. And it was supposed to be the war that ends all wars, according to Wilson, and of course, not soon after, we get World War II. Right? And why was World War II there? What was, well, because some really, really evil people wanted it, and we'll talk about what motivates them, why they want it. And yes, we had to defend ourselves. The West, the UK, the United States had to defend themselves, ultimately, against the evil. But why? Why is this the means for achieving aims? What is war attacking? War attacks human life. But underneath it, what is human life about? What, what makes human life possible? What is it that makes us human? What is really being attacked when we engage in war? What makes us human? Don't say thumbs, please. <laughs> what makes us human? Reason. Reason makes us human. Our ability to think. Ability to conceptualize, to observe the world out there, to abstract away from it, to create general, con uh, general concepts, and ultimately to go out there and change the world to fit our needs. Reason is our means of survival. It is the means by which we exist as human beings. We, we were born with nothing. We're not born with any instincts. We're not born with the ability to survive. None of you have the instinct to hunt, even though some of you might think you have. <laughs> Nobody has the instinct to do agriculture. Today we learn those things, but somebody had to invent them. Like, you know, you try going out there and, and running down a bison and biting into it. Or I don't know if you have bison. You don't have bison in the UK. I don't know. What do you have in the UK? A big, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you kind of have boring cows. Maybe you can run down a cow. <laughs> I'm not sure you could bite into it, though. And yet, you know, if I'm in Colorado or somewhere like that, or Montana, I say, yet I just had a bison burger. You can't get bison burgers in, in the UK. Um, how's that? Well, because we've developed the tools, the skills, the strategies, the hunting capabilities to run down any one of those animals. How do we do that? By using a reason. Reason is the way in which we survive. Reason guides our actions. And reason is, it's through reason that we understand that our well-being depends on our ability to trade with other people who use reason in order to produce and create.
They're fundamental to human survival in a group, in a society. Fundamental to human society is the ability to trade. What is the, what is the fundamental nature of a trade? That it is win-win. That we both benefit. That there are no losers, at least in a transaction. And that wealth, in a sense, is created. That we're better off, wealth being a representative of being better off because of that trade. You know, if you've watched my videos, you know I like to use my iPhone. I bought this for a thousand bucks. How much is this worth to me? More than a, a lot more than a thousand bucks. Don't tell Apple. <laughs> um, <laughs> why? Because this is amazing. I mean, you guys were born with this kind of attached to you, you. I know your generation doesn't know life without an iPhone. But this is, I remember when, you know, when I moved to the United States, um, I moved to the United States in my, in my uh, 20s, and uh, I never called my parents, right? They were in Israel. I moved to the U.S., never called my parents because of long-distance charges. It was just unbelievably expensive. And, and if you call collect, then they get to pay the charges. They didn't want it. It was just super expensive, right? Today, no thought to call anybody anywhere in the world, anytime, or well, maybe the time zone differences, you think about that. Um, I can video conference with my kids, read them a bed night story. I can access every movie, every song ever written. I mean, the beauty of trade. I gained, Apple gained, and I gained enormously wealth in terms of quality of life and human well-being improved dramatically. Reason is the way in which we survive. Reason is the way in which we thrive. Reason is the way in which we interact with one another. And if we disagree, then reason is our means of discovering who's right and who's wrong. Or we have developed means by which we arbitrate disputes. Means by which, if we disagree and cannot settle our dispute, there's a court of law, there's arbitration, there's all kinds of mechanisms by which, what do we do? We present facts, we present evidence, we use reason for a neutral judge to decide who's right or wrong. And then they will. We built, civilization is about building a society grounded in reason, where reason is the way in which we deal with one another in every aspect of life. And what do we do with the people who don't deal with reason? The people who want to cheat or steal or use violence against any one of us. Well, we put them away. They go to jail, at least if it's explicit. So violence we have recognized as something we don't deal with, we don't sanction, we don't let be. Right? So we build these societies based on reason. I think that's what civilization is. Post-enlightenment, that's what the West, that's the contribution that the West has made to the world, is this understanding of the role of reason, and therefore how you build societies based on this principle. And we understand that that requires the elimination of force, at least to some extent, from society. But every single time we do this, and, and this is new, right? We've only, I think the post-enlightenment political era has only been the last 200, 250 years, not more than that. But every time we do this, there are people out there with, who are, you know, reactionaries. People who don't believe that reason is our means of survival. And one of the things that offends them the most is that reason is an attribute of whom? Who reasons? Small people. <laughs> Small people? Not big Small, people? Smart. Smart people. Right? Only smart people reason? Human beings. Yeah, everybody. But, but which are human beings? I mean, how, uh, who reasons? Like there's a particular word I, the particular word I'm looking for, right? It starts with an I. Individuals. Yeah, individuals reason. There's no group reasoning. There's no collective consciousness flowing above your heads here in which thinks for itself. Each one of you 
thinks for yourself. Only you can think for yourself. I mean, it's no different than the fact that who eats? Who said individuals? Individuals. individuals. <laughs> Groups can't, there's no collective stomach. There's no collective immunity. There's no collective anything. Yeah, we're a group of individuals. He's good. He's catching on. <laughs> we're a group of individuals. Only individuals think. And yet, there's always been a train of thought in our world that wants to suppress individuals, that wants to eliminate the individuality of individuals, that wants to collectivize everything. It is the notion that the individual doesn't matter, that the individual doesn't count, that what counts is the group, and that the individual is just a sacrificial animal for the group, that the purpose of life, every aspect of life, is not to serve your happiness, your well-being, your prospects, but it's to serve the group. And you can fill in the blank in which group, it doesn't matter. There are lots of groups that would love your sacrifice, that encourage your sacrifice, indeed often impose their sacrifice on you. So groups, the, this reactionary idea that the collective is what matters, that the individual doesn't matter, keeps coming back. Whether it's the proletarian, that's what matters. You don't matter. What matters is the proletarian. And even if you're part of the proletarian, you particular don't matter. It's the proletarian as a group that matters. And how do we know what the proletarian is good for the proletarian, what's required for the proletarian, what the proletarian needs? How do we know this since whew, the proletarian doesn't speak? Then what do we need if we're gonna, if we're gonna have the proletariat express itself? This one starts with an L. We need a leader. We need somebody who can communicate with these consciousness that the proletarian has. Somebody who can communicate with the world of the proletariat and then tell the proletariat what they really need, what they really want. Any group, every group needs somebody to tell them what they really want because they've stopped thinking as individuals. They've given up that task to the group, but there is no such thing as the group. The group can't think. The group can't act. The group can't do anything. Only individuals exist. So we need one individual, or a group of them, to declare themselves the spokesman of the group, the representative of the group, have some mystical insight into what the group needs, and then tell the group what to do. So, you know, it's not an accident that Marxism evolves into authoritarianism. There's no other way. You need an authority to tell the masses what's good for the proletariat. Otherwise, how would they know? We're not born with that knowledge. No, we're not born with any knowledge. We have to discover the knowledge. How do we know what the Aryan race needs? How much land it needs, how much blood it needs, how much whatever. Well, we need a leader. We need somebody who can commune with the, with the Aryan spirits and tell us what they need. And notice that this communing with the spirits is the opposite of reason. It's the negation of reason. It doesn't involve facts or evidence. It involves revelation, mysticism, the essence of mysticism. Nazism, communism are mystical ideologies. They're not based on reason, as some people would like to claim. They're based on revelation. And both ideologies, all ideologies of collectivism, ultimately will argue, as Lenin did, I think it was Lenin, you know, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. You have to kill a few tens of millions of people to get the utopia we all desired. I mean, Hitler said the same thing. This is the standard. What's good for the group, which I know, because I have communed with the spirits, 
And if we have to kill some people, if some people have to die in order to achieve it, it doesn't matter because the individual does not matter. Only the group, only the collective matters. And this is true of you know, human history going back a long time. I mean, I'll try the tribes that we all belong to a long, long time ago. How did they maintain control over us as individuals? Well, they had a political leader and they had a spiritual leader and they conspired together to do what? To tell you, you knew nothing. The spiritual leader was the one communing and the spirit has said that you have to follow the political leader. And who are you? To disagree and who are you to speak up tribalism and collectivism always rely on two things muscle and spirituality or mysticism in order to achieve their goals right? they need the negation of reason because reason is the tool by which individuals stand up and say I don't agree you don't speak for me I've come to a different conclusion and it's why they Eliminate free speech is one of the first things they do because they want to take away the power, your power, to stand up and say, I don't agree. I want to do something different. At the root of war is a collectivistic vision. At the root of war is the negation of the individual, negation of reason, and the adoration of the collective one kind or another. You see that in Russia right now. I mean, if you listen to Putin, and I encourage you to listen to Putin, he's telling you exactly what he believes. He longs for some great Russian empire where the Russian people are all united around one spirit. And they have to be led because who's going to talk for the Russian people? And those poor Russians in Ukraine, they don't know what's good for them. Putin knows what's good for them. And therefore, Putin speaks for the Russian people and is willing to destroy and kill as many of his own people. I mean, think about all those young, your age, soldiers on the Russian side who know they don't have a clue why they're there because Putin told them to go there. Thousands of them are being killed, right? Now, they're the aggressor, so we somewhat celebrate that, right? Because we're maybe pro-Ukraine. But they're still young, mostly innocent kids who are dying for a cause that is not theirs. They're dying for a cause of their leader who claims to speak for them and who is not challenged by anybody within this collective. All for some Russian, you know, uh, mystical vision of what Russian greatness is supposed to be. I don't know when Russia was great, Maybe somebody can enlighten me later. <laughs> Russia generally has been a pretty dark place, pretty mystical place, and a pretty backward place. It never embraced the Enlightenment. It never embraced capitalism. It never embraced freedom. And as a consequence, it never became particularly rich as a country. Maybe the czars were rich, but then their people were treated horribly. Soviet Union slaughtered tens of millions of people maybe in excess of 100 million, it's not clear. We'll ne probably never know. Putin has said the greatest tragedy of the 20th century is not the Holocaust, not World War I, not World War II. The greatest tragedy of the 20th century is what? That's the Soviet Union. The dismantling of the Soviet Union. <laughs> really? The greatest tragedy? I have bigger tragedies every single day. <laughs> <laughs> So, what do you do when you face a tragedy of that scope? Well, you try to rectify it. You rectify it. How? When you don't care about individuals, when you care about some spiritual direction you're heading in, when you care about some ideal that is not real and that hasn't got nothing to do with the individual lives of the people, your people, when well, you go to war. Every single war is driven by some collectivist ideology. Individualists don't go to war. Individualists seek what? Trade. They're trying to make their lives better. They're trying to better themselves. 
They're trying to make their lives as individuals good. They're trying to pursue their happiness. You don't attain happiness through war. You don't attain success as a human being through war. That is through trade, through study, through self-reflection, through lots of things, lots of ways to make yourself a great human being. Violence is the negation of all of that. And indeed, if you look at history, the periods dominated by collectivism, dominated by collectivistic ideologies, are periods dominated by war. I mean, maybe the bloodiest war in all of Western history is the Thirty Year War, where Catholics who believed they had the truth in the name of all Catholics, and Protestants who believed they had the truth in the name of Protestants, slaughtered each other left and right all over Europe. And on a per capita basis, maybe the bloodiest war ever. Probably more bloody than World War I or World War II. World War I was a war of, I don't know, you guys tell me, it's always bewildered me, uh, the, you know, this war. What? You know, the, the, it, it was a war about empires. It wasn't a war to achieve anything for any individuals within the empire. And yet, millions of young kids your age died. And I remember, you know, uh, the, the, all the stories and history about the Brits going to war, all enthusiastic, we're going to win this for what? For Britain. <sighs> You're going to die for Britain? What is that going to do exactly? And is it for Britain? You're dying in the fields of France? You're dying in the fields of Germany? For what? Is that patriotism? Love of country for oneself, which is what I consider patriotism, because I, I love this country because it allows me to become the best human being I can become? Or was it just bravado, a collectivistic notion of how wonderful Brits are and they can defeat anybody? And let's go and have a, have a go at it some Sunday afternoon. But think how many Brits came back dead. I mean, you can, you can see the grave sites. I mean, it's just horrific. And why, why did the Soviet Union invade Poland? It, people forget that World War II was started not only by Hitler, right? World War II was started on a single day with Hitler invading Poland from the west and Russia and the Soviet Union invading Poland from the, from the east. The start of World War II was both those entities. Why did they do it? Well, Russia, in order to impose the will of the proletarian on everybody, because the proletarian is what matters, and again, no individual matters, and Hitler, in order to impose the will of the Aryan people, to give them more space and to destroy its enemies whatever those were, fantasies that Hitler had about what those, who those enemies were. And everything and anything in the way of achieving that, those collectivistic goals were okay to do, okay to destroy. And note the periods of peace, relative peace. There's never been complete peace on planet Earth, unfortunately. But when are the eras of relative peace? Well, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars until World War I, Europe was mostly peaceful. Why? There were some small wars here and there, but nothing on the scale of what was before and what was after. Why was it relatively peaceful? Industrial Revolution. Yeah, but what is it about the Industrial Revolution? What is it about the process of the war going on during this period that led to peace, of all things? Right. Trade, trade did this globalization, which definitely benefited uh, peace, and we can talk about why globalization encourages peace. But more fundamentally, more essentially, yeah, individualism. <laughs> In the, if you look at the 19th century, what, what is, what's the Enlightenment, particularly the Scottish and British Enlightenment? What is it about? What are the, what are the core principles? Really, I think, two core principles of the Enlightenment. What is the Enlightenment about? What does the Enlightenment bring back? I mean, it, it follows the Renaissance, and the Renaissance brings these back from Greece, and then they're embedded, and then they're philosophically defined during the Enlightenment. Two ideas. The idea that reason is efficacious, that reason is our means of survival, and we learn that from more than anybody, we learn that from Isaac Newton, because he explains the world to us in ways that all of us can understand, in ways that are based on reason. 
math, science, and the whole scientific revolution then explodes, and suddenly we can understand the physical world. But then there's the realization that people have, I can think, and, and this is real, right? Reasoning and thinking is an achievement. And when you're constantly consumed by uh, being told that you shouldn't think for yourself and, and, uh, and thinking is, is, is no good and don't stand out and, you know, your survival is dependent on you working 16-hour days in the fields, nobody has time to think and you, most people can't read. So before the Enlightenment, and, and by the way, truth, the arbiter of truth is not reality. What's the arbiter of truth? A book written 2,000 years ago, that determines truth. Galileo is put under house arrest because he dares question, right? If the earth goes around the sun or the other way around. Because a book said that the sun goes around the earth and therefore that's the truth. So suddenly, suddenly, people wake up to the idea that they can think for themselves, that they have reason. And they say, if I have reason, if I can think for myself, why can't I choose my own profession? You couldn't. What, what did you do back then? What was, the, what was the profession you followed 300 years ago? Whatever your father did, or farming, or whatever. If you were in a guild, then whatever your father did. If you were a woman, forget profession. Forget education, forget it all, right? Most people forget, most kids didn't make it to age 10. Life was pretty miserable. But you couldn't choose your own profession. You know, there's a, it's a funny story. You know why Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci, you know who Leonardo da Vinci is, right? Pretty, pretty uh, real genius. Why did he do whatever he wanted? He was like an engineer and an artist, and uh, he just roamed around, and he did these amazing things. And uh, he didn't follow his father. Anybody know what his father was? His father was a notary. And why didn't Leonardo da Vinci become a notary? Why wasn't he forced into the guild? Why was he allowed to wander and do whatever the hell he wanted? Which was unusual. Like, nobody in those days could do whatever they wanted. Even Michelangelo, when he's painting the Sistine Chapel, he gets fed up. He doesn't want to paint the Sistine Chapel. He wants to go sculpt. His passion is sculpture, not painting. So he runs away. How, what happens when he runs away? Anybody know? The Pope sends his troops, they go catch him, and they bring him back, and he finishes the Sistine Chapel. There's no freedom, right? So, Leonardo, how come he, how could he gets this, uh, this freedom? Because he's a bastard, i.e., a child out of wedlock. And therefore, he can't follow his father's footsteps. He's not allowed to. The guild won't accept him. He's an illegitimate child. That gives him freedom. So in those days, it was, that was a plus one. If you were illegitimate, you could do whatever you wanted. <laughs> but that's the kind of society we lived in where everything was regimented because we didn't trust that you had the capacity to reason. It's only the Enlightenment that liberated us. And then, who did you marry? Who your parents told you to marry? Who were your political leaders? Whoever the aristocrats decided they were, you had no say in it. And suddenly people woke up and said, wait a minute, if I can think for myself, if I can understand the physical world like Newton explained it to me, why can't I choose my spouse? Why can't I choose what career to have? And why can't I choose my political leaders? And that is the political revolution that is, comes out of the Enlightenment. So the discovery of reason and the discovery that the individual matters, individualism are the two ideas that come out of the Enlightenment. And what they generate in the 19th century is an industrial revolution. The industrial revolution just doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of these ideas. And it's not an accident that happens here in Britain because this is the heart of the Enlightenment. It happens here in the United States and it slowly filters into Western Europe. And once people start respecting individuals, once people start seeing the world as not a zero sum, but as an additive, Suddenly, wealth is being created. Trade makes everybody richer. Everybody richer. Why go to war? We're too busy making money. 
too busy pursuing values, too busy pursuing a happiness, too busy trading, too busy making life good on earth. Right? Remember, life sucked. Most of you are middle-aged, right? Because you're going to be dead in your 30s. That's life expectancy back then. 39 in the most developed places in the world. 39, life expectancy. Most kids don't see the age of 10. Common for women to buy, die at childbirth. And you basically walk from sunrise to sunset. No reading. Partially because very few people knew how to read. Partially because there's no light. At night, you go to sleep. Nothing else to do. The Industrial Revolution liberated us. And people recognized that. And they recognized they were too busy living to want to fight a war. But these powers, these reactionary powers of collectivism, keep reasserting themselves. Marx, Hegel, Schopenhauer, all our great supposed Western philosophers were all collectivists rebelling against the Enlightenment from Kant on every single one of primarily German philosophers and French, French and German. <laughs> All bad things. Anyway, um, <laughs> they rebelled against the individualism. They rebelled against the idea of reason. And in rebelling against individual reason, res kept resurrecting the collectivism. And you can see in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the growing influence and the growing appeal of collectivism. And World War I, in a sense, is inevitable once those ideas are common. And World War II is suddenly inevitable once you have communism and then fascism as supposedly the counterforce to communism, when both are really the same thing. And then after World War II, you get again a dominance of a culture the American culture was fundamentally individualistic, fundamentally grounded in reason, fundamentally interested in wealth creation, fundamentally interested in trade. And you get a world order that is focused on trade, and you get slowly, you get greater and greater and greater globalization. And yes, you still have wars here and there, but you don't get the wars on the scale that you got in the past. And we've relatively, certainly in Europe, over the last 80 years, lived in a pretty peaceful place, 75 because we've been too busy living, too busy creating, too busy building. But there are always reactionary forces on the edges who want it otherwise, who want to bring back the collectivism, and you're seeing it on this campus, on every campus. You're seeing the reactionary forces of collectivism within our own midst. You're seeing it in America, which is split now along tribal lines collectivists of the right and collectivists of the left. And while I'm mostly anti-left, I am vehemently anti-collectivist rightists. The right is just as bad as the left if they're collectivist. The enemy is not right or left, the enemy is collectivism. The proper way to think about politics is that there's a spectrum. Collectivism over here, evil, bad, really, really nasty, and individualism over here. And there's a fork in collectivism. There are at least two different branches. One that goes left towards communism and socialism, one that goes right towards fascism and nationalism and a bunch of other isms. Which one is worse? It doesn't matter when you're dead. It doesn't matter when you're a slave. It doesn't matter when they put you down and you're a pawn of the state. It doesn't matter if they did it in the name of a red flag or I don't know what the other flag's color is. But on the other side is individualism. And individualism stands for the sanctity of each one of our lives, where the state only job is to protect that sanctity, to protect your life, should be, not is, right? To protect you, to protect you from force and coercion and bad guys and war and fraud and pretty much that's it. That's capitalism, the system that protects individual rights, the system that excludes from society the anti-reason. What's anti-reason? Force. So capitalism, the political system's only job under capitalism is to eliminate force. Stealing, cheating, fraud, murder. Pretty much it. Arbitrate disputes so we don't go dueling in the streets. And other than that, leave us alone. Because as individuals, capable of reason, who else knows what's good for us other than ourselves? 
Only we as individuals know what's good for us, what's right, what values to pursue and how to pursue them. So war is the most horrific activity men engage in. But to eradicate war, we have to have a positive ideal to offer in its stead and to understand where it comes from. It comes from collectivism. It comes from mysticism. It comes from the negation of the two ideas of the Enlightenment, reason and individualism. If we want to end war, what we need is more capitalism. What we need is more freedom. What we need is more individuals pursuing their values. What we need is more respect for the individual and his capacity to think and reason and choose his own values and follow his own path towards his own happiness. The solution to war is capitalism, is individualism. And that, particularly in a world where now your generation is seeing war, maybe for the first time, in real time, in its destructive nature, that is something worth rallying around as an anti-war agenda, an agenda of individualism and freedom. Thank you all. Gentlemen, uh, George Smith and Miss Sasha Bassett will be walking around with microphones for you to use to ask questions. And I'm sure we'll take every and all questions you have. So, one person each other in, and we'll get started. Oh, uh, before we do that, uh, our colleague from the Students' Guild will ask me to remind you that this is recorded, so if you don't wish to be recorded, you don't ask a question. Go <laughs> ahead. Uh, yep. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Francis Fukuyama in The End of History famously said, you know, at the end of the Cold War, capitalism, the, the new neoliberal world order will prevent wars. And, uh, you know, that was it. It was the end of history. It was time for, like, a new kind of unipolarity of, of American capitalism. But since you had Clash of Civilizations by Huntington arguing that, no, there will be a multipolar war, uh, world, sorry. And obviously, yes, we are living in this long peace. But do you think since 2020... China on the verge of war with Taiwan, obviously Ukraine, you think that actually world capitalism is, is failing and it needs some kind of revamping as, as the world order is starting to kind of collapse a bit? All right, there's a lot there. So um, I think, so let's start with Fukuyama. Uh, Fukuyama is wrong, not because he identifies that um, collectivism in the form of communism failed and therefore was destroyed and uh, and that is you know I get a good thing but he's wrong because he associated with the West um, you know he, he thinks of the West as this liberal democracies what does that even mean um, he has no concept of individual rights he calls it capitalist, but really, do we live in capitalism? I mean, is, is the government separated from the economy? Does the government not regulate and control and tax almost every single activity we're engaged in? We're far, we're far removed from capitalism. So communism died. And then what we were left with is what's called a mixed economy. Some capitalism, some freedom, and some controls. Quite a bit of controls. And it varied. You know, the United States maybe had less controls and more freedom, maybe. Uh, Europe had maybe more controls and less freedom. But, but it was these mixtures. And basically what he said is the mixture won. And the mixture is the end of history. And that's bizarre. Because the whole point of a mixture is it's a mixture. The two still elements still exist. A mixture like that is unsustainable. You can't have... I, I associate controls and all of that with collectivism and the freedom with individualism. A mixture of collectivism and individuals is not stable. It will either drift towards more freedom or it will drift towards more collectivism. But in the end, the battle between collectivism and, and individualism was just beginning. He should have said the beginning of history because it just started. And you're seeing with the decline of individualism in the West, particularly in the U.S., what you're seeing today is that collectivism, that battle over collectivism, is, is heating up in the U.S. I mean, if the, I, I expect more war in our future, not less. Not because capitalism leads to war, but because collectivism is on the rise everywhere. I mean, 
I know I don't want to offend you Brits, but, you know, the whole point of Brexit, the whole point of Brexit was to make you freer. It's made you less free. That's a reality. So I said when Brexit happened, it's a great idea if they do the right thing with it, right, because it gives you control. You did the wrong thing with it. So you have all the regulations that Brussels imposed on you, then now British regulations. Cool. <laughs> They're still the same regulations. They're still the same limitations, still the same control. It's just London instead of Brussels. Who cares? And what you've given up, so you have the same regulations. Uh, you, you know, maybe you could have escaped a little bit from the green agenda in Brussels. Good luck. Johnson is going to outgreen the Greens. <laughs> He's going to make sure that you're way more green than anything Brussels intended. Right? And that, of course, notice with the war in Ukraine, that is now problematic. And at the same time, you lost. What did you lose? The free flow of people. I was in line uh, uh, in, uh, in Madrid, in line to get into Spain with all these Brits complaining and bemoaning because a couple of years ago they could go in the fast track lane with all the Europeans and I would have stuck with me, the American, in this long way. It took an hour to go through passport control in Madrid, right? And all the Brits were complaining about it. I mean, it's an hour. It's not a big deal, but it's a big deal. One of the things I love most about Europe is I can get into a car in Lisbon, drive to Madrid, to Amsterdam, to Paris, to anywhere, and never see a border control. You don't appreciate that until it's taken away from you. And you Brits have just taken it away, and you'll start appreciating the freedom you used to have. Then, trade. The whole idea was that the British Isles was going to become a free trade zone. They, 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 I, I remember people arguing and saying why they were for Brexit. We would now have trade policy in our control, so we'll lower tariffs with the rest of the world. How's that going for you? <laughs> you raise tariffs with the rest of the world. You raise them with Europe. It's very difficult to send a package to Europe or get a package from Europe. You don't have any more free trade with the U.S. than you had before. You, you can't even pass a free trade agreement with Canada. Canada, right? Um, you've done nothing. You've made yourself much more protectionist. So this, what ultimately I'm convinced drove Brexit is nationalism, not freedom. It was never about freedom. It was about nationalism. And a little bit of xenophobia thrown in there. There's certain people you'd rather exclude, and, and, and it was hard to do when you were part of the European Union. Now you're Brits, you can exclude them freely. So you had free movement of labor. My hotel is understaffed. Every hotel here is understaffed because they don't get those uh, you know, temporary workers from all over Europe easily. Uh, you don't have free movement of labor, which is hard. You don't have free movement of goods, and you're not going to have free movement of capital. So. All the good things about the European Union, and those, and, and you think, oh, well, those, there are only three things. Those are biggies. Those are like, if you believe in freedom, those are big. If you believe in, in the benefits of globalization. So it's the rise of collectivism in the UK. And, and you're seeing that on both left and right. And you're seeing, and you're seeing that in different ways on both left and right, because the collective is composed of different people. But it's, it's the same phenomena. So, you know, it, it, when I look at the world from that perspective, it looks pretty bleak, right? You're looking rising uh, right-wing nationalism all over Europe, and at the same time, rising influence of the radical left uh, at universities, and, you've, and everybody's now bifurcated. You're the collectivist of the right, the collectivist of the left, and, and, and where's sanity, and where's rationality, and where's capitalism? Nobody's a capitalist. Nobody's a, that's the one thing you can be sure of. Nobody actually believes in capitalism or freedom anymore. Like Donald Trump was the opposite of capitalism. And Boris Johnson is the opposite of capitalism. There's no freedom anymore. That's the one thing that's not. So whatever happens, it's not capitalism. It's not global capitalism. Now, you asked about China. Um, for a variety of reasons, I don't believe China will invade Taiwan anytime soon. You can write that down and call me on it if I get it wrong. I didn't think Putin would invade Ukraine, so I admit that I get stuff wrong sometimes. I, I think China's plan for Taiwan is longer term. I think we're looking at 10, 15 years. Uh, the hope is that they can integrate it peacefully because they can convince the Taiwanese that they're better off under China. I don't think that'll work for them. So ultimately, they'll invade, but they're waiting, partially because their military is still too weak, relative, and the Taiwanese the Taiwanese has a much stronger military than Ukraine, much more sophisticated, much more better technology. Um, 
So I think that's going to wait. But yes, you're going to see more wars in the world because of collectivism, because we're moving away from capitalism. It really is interesting that as the world moves away from capitalism, and it's one of the least capitalist countries in Europe, or the least capitalist country in Europe, that did the invading. Russia is the least capitalist country in Europe. It's an authoritarian state that allows for only one industry, basically, natural resources. There's no entrepreneurship. There's no you know, technology. There's no business creation. There's no trade. There's, they, they, go, they, they extract oil and they sell it. They extract natural gas and they sell it. That's brute force kind of industries. Um, they depend on all their, this is why they're losing and why uh, the Russian economy is going to be devastated. For anything sophisticated in the Russian economy, they need Germany or they need the United States. They can't produce anything sophisticated in, in Russia. Um, and you can see their tanks are worthless, their airplanes are worthless. If they ever got into a fight with NATO, they would be crushed in a day. And you're seeing the consequence of authoritarianism and anti-capitalism on their ability to wage war. Right? So, but it, it, it had to be. You're not going to see a free capitalist country initiate war for some mystical, arbitrary reason like uh, the Russians did. That was a long answer. So this side. I know, you choose. Oh, I have the responsibility. You have the responsibility <laughs> of choosing. I get a talk, you get a choose. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. But I want to kind of zone in on this idea of individualism, because you used it quite a few times um, yeah. in the talk. He did, I didn't. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure he knows, yeah. But individualism, I think... Yes, yeah, sure, we're all individuals, and we can all be part of groups, and uh, that might be defined as, you know, collectivism when it gets to that point of, uh, you know, particular individuals um, having their views for everyone else, and through that guise of collectivism. But individualism, I mean, as, as a whole, um, it's kind of like referred to quite a lot, um, libertarians especially, I'll, um, I'll admit as this sort of like it's freedom, it's um, individual liberty, and conceptually it's a bit Mickey Mouse. I mean, in reality, I don't think it really gets to that point. I mean, we, we see that um, societies are, I mean, they, they are groups, and they may be made of individuals, but surely, surely you can see, though, that um, in these uh, societies they inevitably do uh, result in this hierarchical form of, like, well, government, uh, in group settings, it always delves and devolves into these hierarchies. Is it just that's the natural state of being? Maybe we reason towards groups. Maybe we reason towards collectivism. Maybe reason is not necessarily just, you know, um, individualism is right, collectivism is wrong. Maybe this is just the natural state of being. Uh, no, 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 and no. Um, <laughs> The fact that something exists doesn't make it right, doesn't make it just, doesn't make it good. Indeed, most of human existence we have lived in political and cultural, what's a technical term? I think it's shitholes. <laughs> really, really bad places that human beings shouldn't live. And you could say, you could sit in the, in the ninth century in, uh, in, in Britain or in, uh, and say, this is life, can't expect anything better than this. And indeed, everybody did. And Hobbes, right, one of your guys, said life was what? Short, brutish, and, oh, nasty, brutish, and short, something like that, right? I, I don't remember the order, right? And it was. <laughs> it was. But we are better than that. And that's what the last, you know, if you'd asked this question 300 years ago, I would have said, you know, maybe. But we've just lived through this amazing period. How much richer are we today than we were 300 years ago, on average? In terms of dollars or pounds, we're 300 times richer. But that's minimizing the effect. Because how do you measure the value of electricity? Not your electricity bill. The value of electricity is gazillion times more than your electricity bill. The uh, problem with economics is we can only measure things that have dollar signs next to them. We can't measure actually actual utility. What's the benefit of electricity or plumbing, indoor plumbing, toilets? I'm pretty, you know, that's more than just a little bit. That's more than 300 times better, 
right? Having the ability to flush a toilet. The iPhone? I haven't even started describing all the wonders of an iPhone. <laughs> it's not 300 times better. We're thousands of times better. And, the fact, and what's interesting is that 300 years ago, there might have been 500 million people on planet Earth. The 8 billion of us. And generally, we're all living better. There's you know, maybe 5 to 10% of the people who are not, who are still living the way that we lived 300 years ago, and that's a tragedy. But they can do better, and they will do better if they get the right ideas. If you study history, what you see is that ideas shape history, not, well, it's human nature. That's what we do. We kill each other. No, we don't. We don't have to. We do, but we don't have to. And the question always is, will we rise to the challenge? Will we exert the effort? As I said, thinking, using reason requires effort. Will we use that effort? And to do that, we have to teach people that they can do it. This is why I really hate these uh, evolutionary psychologists who tell you you're just a product of your genes and nothing you do makes any difference. But you're not. And you're not a product of your environment either. That's BS as well. Yeah, you're a little bit of a product of both, but what's the real factor that determines who you are? You. The choices you make. The free will that you have, whether you acknowledge it or not. Whether Sam Harris likes it or not. <laughs> we all have free will. We are the writers of our own script. Now, some of us choose not to engage the free will, and then we're just products of society. And then if collectivists rise to power, we become collectivists. And if, if it's collectivists to the right, collectivists to the left, it just, we are do what we are told. But you have the ability to write the script yourself. You have the ability to take control over your own life. And you have the ability, therefore, to be an individual. And what does individualism mean? It means that your life is valuable to you. Indeed, it's the most valuable thing you have. You don't have anything more valuable than your life. And that you don't want, because you have this mind, you don't want to be told how to live. You want to make those choices yourself. Now, people can advise you. People can recommend. You can read great books about how people have lived. And then you get to make the choice of how you live. That's what individualism means. And if you are like that, then you don't want authorities and coercion and people telling you what's true and what's not, what's right or what's wrong, what to, who to marry and who not to marry. Right? We've overcome that. And we're at, a, we're at a turning point right now, Western civilization is. It has these liberties, it's had these freedoms for a long time, at least to some extent. And we're giving them away. We're, we're throwing them in the rubbish. And we're doing it in the name of what? In the name of ancient reactionary ideologies. I mean, I love the fact that the, the I don't know, the, 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 the modern left thinks they're inventing something new. No, they're just rehashing the same old, you know, failed policies and failed ideas that have destroyed human life everywhere they've been tried in the world. And the new right is doing exactly the same thing. Rehashing the same ideas that have destroyed, you know, there's nothing new here. They're just, we're the, you know, we're trying to save civilization to the extent that we're fighting for individualism. But what else is there to fight for? So I'm not saying groups are not valuable. Of course groups are valuable. Families are valuable. Friendship is valuable. Business. Business is a group, right? We, 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 but, but what's the nature of groups like that? The nature of groups like that is the voluntary engagement. Except family. You're stuck with the parents who had you. That's the one involuntary thing, right? Uh, and hopefully they're good parents, and, and that's OK. But if they're not good parents, it sucks. But so you want to maximize your voluntary interactions and to minimize the interactions that you, you can't avoid, like family, right? And even there, if your parents are lousy, don't hang out with them. <laughs> I had good parents and I moved 5,000 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I quite liked it. Uh, I was quite surprised, especially as a reactionary. But uh, <laughs> my my question is rather on a similar line to Owen's. It's uh, I agree with your general premise that civilization is built upon reason and rationality, but I think there's uh, something within human nature and uh, 
the desire, our desire within humanity for destruction, for death. I think uh, Freud called it the Thanatos. It's why uh, you get alcoholics drinking themselves to death, you get gamblers throwing everything away, you get drug addicts. We've got something within us that wants to do something unreasonable, wants to go to war, wants to do something wrong. How would you uh, fix that with your ideas of freedom and liberty? Yes, I think it's a mistake to think of it as something within us. Look, what makes us different than the animals is our reason. But reason requires effort to engage. If you don't engage in reason, you become an animal. Animals are driven by their instincts. We don't have instincts, not the same way they do, that guides every action. So we have emotions. So when you kill your reason, what you're left with is emotions. Emotions are not tools of cognition. They're not a way to live life. They're beautiful. I mean, I'm a passionate guy. You live through, you experience life through your emotions. But they're not guides to action. They're not guides of cognition. And that needs to be taught. That needs to be expected of people. Civilization doesn't just happen. It needs to be embraced. It needs to be, people need to think about it. People need to be engaged with it. And, you know, so, so there's a reason why the Industrial Revolution happens after the Enlightenment, because people were, were engaged in these ideas. And they embraced them. And that's why we got to where we are today. But it's easy to give up in the sense that we are flooded with ideologies that tell us, and from postmodernism to, I don't know, every, every, every version of philosophy that exists out there, every version of intellectuals that exists out there, all at the end of the day, are anti-reason. You know, reality is whatever you want it to be, or you create your own reality, or there's no such thing as objective facts. Facts is just whatever you feel like they are today or tomorrow. I mean, we're flooded with this. And our philosophy department, I'm sure here at Exodus, flooded with this in the sociology and psychology. And, and you quoted Freud, which is another one of these, you know, mystics. Right? It's not fact-based. It's not science-based. It's not reason-based. And, you know, the world is driven not by our instincts, not by something in bad inside of us. That's, that's the Christian in you guys, right? You've got original sin. There's something bad inside of you. No. You've got emotions if you've got reason. And if, you, if you're brought up to think, then that's what you, you know, and, and if you respect thinking, then that's what you do. But ideas will influence you. Idea will either undercut or support. And in this context... All of the West has basically been a battle between two philosophers, Aristotle and Plato. And you can track the entire history between these two. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful book called The Cave and the Light, which I recommend, um, that basically does that. It tracks Western civilization you know, and the influence of Aristotle and Plato. But think, what, what does Plato represent? Well, he represents a cave. You guys are in a cave. This is why the, the book is called The Cave and the Light. You're in a cave. You don't see reality. You don't know what reality is. You can't reason because you don't have facts. You can't access the facts. Who accesses the facts? Who can actually step outside of the cave and see the world as it is? The philosopher king. And therefore, he has all the knowledge. You're just an ignorant nobody. And you have to be. There's no way for you to escape that. Only certain people can be philosopher kings. Only certain people can be the Fuhrer or the guy who represents the proletarian. Only people can be Putin and reflect the will of the Russian people. Right? But that's the philosopher king. And that's embedded in our Western civilization, not because it's in our genes, but because that's what we've been taught forever. I mean, Christianity is a version of this. The Pope communes with the spirits. He knows. You just have to follow and do what you're told. You don't think for yourself. Nobody wants you. Nobody expects you. Nobody demands it of you. So religion is platonic, not accidentally. It doesn't associate reason with individuals. It associates ignorance with individuals. And only some individuals who commune with the spirits get to decide everything. So we live, collectivism is a philosophy of philosopher kings. And then Aristotle is the opposite. 
Aristotle is about logic and about reason and about the individual having, possessing logic and reason. And therefore making their own decisions. And he rejects the world of forms, that mystical place in which we can commune with to get our knowledge. And he says, no, it's all here, reality. That's what matters. I'm on Aristotle's side. But it's a battle. It's not human nature. Eh. No, it's a battle. It's a battle each side, each one of us, if we have the knowledge. And if we don't have the knowledge, then it's a battle between people's respect for their own mind and the dismissal of it and the, and the appeal of their emotions. And, you know, if, if, if we, you know, as intellectuals, as people who go to college, or, you know, I, I think part of what our responsibility is, if we want a good world, is to exhibit the behavior of individuals following reason and model that so that, you know, people see that it's good and follow it. Wow. All right, I better make my answer shorter, otherwise we'll, <laughs> I'll miss my train. Um, how can someone with a purely individualistic framework handle the allocation of essential yet arbitrary placed and finite resources? What resources? Coal, iron, oil. I mean, coal, iron, uh, oil are not resources. So 200 years ago, if you happen to own land in which there was oil seeping from the ground, you basically, you know, were depressed because the oil just destroyed the value of your property. It was, it was horrible. You couldn't grow anything on the property now. All this gucky black stuff was horrible. What turns the black stuff into a resource? Reason, science, technology, people's ability to think. So there are resources all over the world, but what matters is not the stuff, because anything could become a resource. Sand. Who thought sand would become what? Glass. Glass, okay, that's cool. Cooler than glass. Sand castles. What? <laughs> What's in here? Silicon. Yeah, it's sand. There's sand in here. Silicon. That's a resource, and everybody has it. But to turn sand into silicone and to put it into a chip and to make a computer from it, wow, that's stunning. And yet everybody has access to it because everybody has sand. So the real resource, the only resource that matters is the human mind. It's our ability to reason. And the fact is the civilization that had, quote, resources, often were not rich for very long. Spain finding all that gold in South America, who got rich off of that gold? You guys did. The Brits did. They, they, it all went to UK and to Amsterdam and a place like that. Why? Because you produce stuff. They just mine stuff. Why isn't Russia fabulously rich? It has immense resources. Because resources don't really matter. What matters is the freedom to use your mind to produce and create and build and, and, and trade stuff. Uh, but so. The whole idea of natural resources is important. My favorite place used to be, up until about a year ago, two years ago, one of my favorite places on planet Earth was Hong Kong. Just an amazing, stunning, beautiful place with amazing people, you know. <laughs> you know filled with energy and production and success. Here's a little place that used to be a fishing village that seven and a half million people live on today. More skyscrapers in Manhattan. GDP per capita greater than the United States, done in 70 years, when it took the United States 250 years. How many natural resources do they have? None, zero, zilch. What did they have? A British governor who by accident be, not listening to the government, which was socialist, uh, by accident imposed freedom on the Hong Kong. Basically said, we're not going to do anything. We'll protect your property rights to the extent, you know, we'll protect your contracts. You can come and go as you, free, as you see, you can say whatever the hell you want. You can't vote. 
<laughs> but other than that, we'll protect every other freedom except voting. <laughs> and guess what? People from all over Asia came there because not because they wanted welfare, not because they wanted free health care, not because they wanted anything for free, because they wanted freedom. They wanted to be able to do their thing. They wanted to use the one natural resources they had. And, and, and many of them achieved great wealth. Many of them achieved middle classhood. And they keep coming. Seven and a half million. And they keep coming into this tiny little place. So uh, being there is now, you know, it's finished because China's taking it over. It's imprisoned all those freedom fighters. It's hollowed out. A lot of people have left. Luckily, you guys in the UK offered them all visas to come here. Good for you. I wish the United States had half the balls that you did in this case. Um, Canada offered them, so they're all gone, right? The talent is, is leaving. If it hasn't left already, it's leaving. Because talent doesn't tolerate authoritarianism. It doesn't tolerate authority. It doesn't tolerate people telling them what they can and cannot do. You want to be free if you, if you have the ability, right? Even if you don't have ability, you want to be free. This side. Um, thank you for the talk and uh, for all the work you do with the Ayn Rand Institute. Um, this is more of a practical question. Um, we saw classical liberalism and the ideas of the Enlightenment ever so slowly uh, degrading in, from ideas of negative freedom into positive freedom. Um, I think this can be summed up quite well in a quote um, from Milton Friedman, where, to paraphrase, he says something like, um, libertarianism doesn't have a PR department, but governments do. Right? Doesn't they, have a what? A PR a PR, yes. Public relations. Yeah. Um, uh, and so how, and I, I asked this question uh, of an MP of ours, Sir Christopher Chope, um, how do we make freedom sexy and stop it from uh, <laughs> declining into a more positive uh, idea of so-called freedom that, that is uh, actually just collectivism under a, a different banner? My guess is he gave you a lame answer. Because um, <laughs> what do politicians know? Um, freedom depends on philosophical premises. Freedom requires that at least those of us who advocate for it, who are going to go out and market it and make it sexy, have a deep understanding of the philosophical foundations of freedom. And I know libertarians don't like hearing this, certainly conservatives don't. Um, you need Ayn Rand. You need a philosophy. You need a metaphysics and epistemology and an ethics. You need grounding. You come across as, we love freedom, we want to take our drugs. That's what you come across. I mean, that's what libertarians come across, particularly in the US, right? Um, and even if you don't want to take your drugs, right? I mean, it's, that's what it comes across as. You need to have an intellectual, philosophical argument. The attack on you is not random. It is from Plato. It's not a second-rate guy. It's like a first-rate guy. The attack against individualism and capitalism and freedom is from Plato. It's from Immanuel Kant. It's from Hegel and Schopenhauer and Marx and Nietzsche even. And these are big shots. And you have maybe Locke, Hume, who's a skeptic. So, you know, it's freedom and skepticism. I'm not sure go together. Anna Smith, who basically said, yeah, we all practice our self-interest, but we don't really like self-interest, but, so the, but there's an invisible hand that makes the self-interest all be good again because society's better off, so he falls onto collectivism in the end. You don't have intellectuals. You don't have, you know, the firepower to win. And you gotta have Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is the only one you have. And yet, the sad tragedy of libertarianism and, and people who advocate for free markets is that they've rejected Ayn Rand. Uh, I mean, Im imagine a world in which Hayek actually respects Ayn Rand, doesn't have to agree with her, but just respects her and engages in, in, a, in a dialogue and promotes her as a philosopher, right? I imagine a world in, me in which von Mises, the, I think the greatest economist who ever lived, says, look, I'm a great economist, but I'm not a philosopher. Rand, you, for the philosophy, go to who? No, he has to have proxology and all this nonsense and try, to, and try to be a philosopher instead of sticking to what he's really, really good at, which is economics. Same with Hayek, by the way. Great economist, just middle-of-the-road social thinker. He's just not that exceptional when it comes to his social thinking. He's fairly conventional. Um, so to make it sex... And, and think about within the libertarian world, the free market world, who makes it sexy? Who brings people to these ideas more than anybody else? 
Who's more sexy than Dagny Taggart? <laughs> yes. Or Howard Rourke, if you're, you know. <laughs> that, you know, so you need art, you need aesthetics, you need philosophy, and we definitely need aesthetics and art. You need to be able to convey the ideas in a variety of different formats, but you need for that a philosophical grounding. You know, the problem, how can libertarians defend good art when they're, the, the, the two, they're subjectivist in too many areas in their life, including art. Well, anything goes. No, some art is good, some art is lousy, and some stuff that we consider art is not even art at all. Right? But you need standards. And where are you going to get those standards? Not from your emotions, from your reason. You need a philosophy. So what we need is to embrace a real philosophy, and I think Ayn Rand is it. I keep promising short answers. Um, I think you said at the beginning that nobody wins in war. Um, there's a commonly held idea that um, banks and you know benefit from war. Um, I was wondering, do you agree with this? And if so, could you attribute uh, at least partially war to um, banks as a large lobbying power? No. I mean, suddenly um, it might be true that in the distant past you know, bankers lent money to kings so they could engage in war, and then those loans were paid off. But it wasn't like other loans were not paid off. You know, they lent it to a king, and the king did what he wanted with the money. And indeed, sometimes, I think this is true of York, um, sometimes the king decides after the war, instead of to return the debt, to kill the people he borrowed the money from. Not very helpful to the to the to the moneylenders. This was uh, the case of killing the Jews. I think in York at some point was a king or a, or a prince or whatever, an aristocrat who decided not to pay off his debt to the Jewish moneylenders. Um, so I, you know, did the Rothschilds benefit? There's this mythology that the Rothschilds benefit. What they benefited from was better information than everybody else, and they could play the market based on war. What was it? They knew more who won one of the battles with Napoleon before everybody else, so they, 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 they played it in the market. But no, how do banks win? Banks lend you money, and then if you can't pay it back because you lost the war, they lose. And if you pay it back because you won the war, then they just got what was theirs anyway. But what's the upside? Where's this huge upside that they get? I don't know. I, I don't get it. And certainly, I don't know any time in history where bankers were the ones who promoted war. Promoted war. I mean, I, I'm, were the bankers in Russia pushing for this? Now that they've been sanctioned by, by the whole world, I doubt that the bankers in Russia pushed for this. Um, I'm trying to think of American bankers and, and wars that Americans have been engaged in. I, I don't think J.P. Morgan has benefited from the war in Afghanistan or the war in Iraq or any of these wars. I mean, certainly if you build weapons, maybe. If you're going to blame any industry, the weapon building industry is probably the, the one that is most uh, eager to go to war because they want to see their, it's a best marketing, right? So right now, if, if, if you make uh, anti-tank uh, uh, missiles in the West, you're looking pretty good versus if you make T-72s. <laughs> um, I yeah. Right. Uh, thank you so much for, for an excellent talk. Um, so you talked about how uh, sort of, um, capitalism and, and individualism sort of go hand in hand against the, and you know, obviously there's the threat of collectivism. But surely there are some cases when capitalism can threaten um, individualism, and particularly with regards to uh, censorship with big tech that we're seeing increasingly at the moment. Um, so um, how, how do you uh, suggest that we can kind of create a way to safeguard against these kinds of uh, capitalistic threats to individualism? So I don't think you can blame any phenomena, I don't know if this is mine or not. Um, <laughs> let me take this one, this is mine. Uh, I don't think you can blame any phenomena that exists today among big tech or about anybody in capitalism, because we don't live in a capitalist world. So yes, uh, the big tech is, is restricting what you can say in ways that we find offensive. And absolutely, we should all find offensive. We do find it offensive. But do we know uh, whether, A, whether this is uh, their strings being pulled in the background where government is, is telling them? I mean, you can see this with Facebook, right? The government brings Zuckerberg in and says, behave or we'll regulate you. 
Now, what does that mean? What does behave mean? It means do what they tell you. Otherwise, they'll regulate you, which is force. So are they acting in, in capitalist freedom? Or are they trying to figure out what the government wants them to do and, 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 and trying to do that? There's elements of that. Also, to what extent is it easy to compete with them? Um, well, there's already competition to Twitter and, and Facebook. It's not very successful, but that might be because of the culture. Maybe we want to be limited in what we can say, right? The culture seems to think that. In capitalism, there'd be more competition. But more importantly, to get to the point where we have capitalism, the culture has to change dramatically. We are going to be different. We're going to be more individualistic. So are the people running the successful companies. And it's not a problem. It would never become a problem. If it became a problem, then as individuals, we'll all say, you know what? Twitter's behaving really, really badly. We're going to stop using it. We're not individualist enough today to stop using Twitter. I mean, how hard is it to just say, I don't like this company, what they're doing, or I don't like what China's doing, so I'm not going to buy Chinese goods, or I'm not going to... That's what individualists do. They make moral decisions for themselves. They don't go with the crowd or do what their government tells them to do. Uh, we have time for two more quick questions, so Dr. Brooke can actually get his train on time. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Excellent speech. Thank, thank you. you for uh, rating my city so highly. <laughs> uh, no, I, I suppose it's a bit of a summary of um, all the questions we've asked. Um, you say an exhibition of trade, of, of individualism, and of maybe art and philosophy is way out to this whole thing. But uh, allow me to quote China again as an example. Back in the 80s, when we uh, signed the Sino-British Joint Declaration and during the open-up policy period, there, there was sort of a dream that we, we were thinking China would turn into Hong Kong instead of Hong Kong turning into China. But obviously that didn't happen. Now It says push here. Should I push to see what happens? You can, you can stop the recording and... Uh, oh, okay, and, I won't uh, do that. You know, we can say... It says speak push here, yes. I follow orders. But, uh, no, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, but now, now as, as we see, uh, as, as, a, as a result of that handover and a lot of other events... Right, so, so I'm going to shorten it because, because we're short on time. So the question is China. No, no. How does China really, no, no, fit into really, my talk? Not really, as in, in, okay. in, in large sense, it's just an example. Uh, now, China, Russian oligarchs, a lot of other people, uh, yep. they basically hold capital and they, they hold every every single mean of production. They hold media. Yeah. They hold they, China have tech talk. They... they, yep. they, 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 they um, a lot uh, TikTok is not based, by the way. Uh, uh, not not the little dark edits, uh, but uh, uh, no. Uh, so they hold everything. They allow capitalism to flourish for until it reaches that goal. Look at Alibaba; it's a great business. Jack Ma used to be the typical example of how Chinese could become rich after. Yeah, I that. get it. question. But, but, but yeah, but uh, the question is: now they've dominated all of those ways that we can sort of fight back. How 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 can we do it? <laughs> um, I don't think they're as dominant as you think they are. China is completely dependent on the West. Um, it's dependent on the West for technology. It is not, almost no real innovations have come out of China. They're very good at copying and making stuff better. They're very poor at innovating. Um, almost no innovations come from China because authoritarian regimes don't innovate. Um, China has all its money in U.S. bonds. I wouldn't put my money in U.S. bonds. But they have all their money in U.S. bonds, trillions of dollars of U.S. bonds. If they do something like, China, like Russia did and the United States froze their accounts, stopped paying them back on the debt that they supplied, China's in big trouble. So one of the beauties of trade is you make, it makes you mutually dependent. right? We in the West depend on their stuff. They, are, they depend on our investments on our cash. Um, you know, the world would survive the loss of TikTok. It would be tough for some people, but we could survive. Uh, what's that? Yeah. And, and TikTok is probably the most innovative company to come out of China in, in recent years, right? So I don't think China's anywhere near as big of a threat as people think it is. It's, a, it's certainly a threat to Hong Kong b because Partially because the world didn't care, partially because the Brits basically signed it away anyway, and partially because they took advantage of a weak American administration. Everybody thinks Trump was tough on China. He was 
pathetic on China. And as a consequence, they snuck in during Trump's administration and took it over and it disappeared. But, you know, they hesitated for a long time. They let those demonstrations go for a long time. They took advantage of COVID, to, you know, to everybody was distracted, and they did it. Um, and look, if the West had been capitalist, if the West has understood the value of individualism, maybe we wouldn't have been so eager to hand everything over in terms of trade. Maybe we would have been, as I said before, maybe we would have been thought again about, should we trade with China? In, in what? And as China becomes more authoritarian since Xi came about, how do we adjust our policies given that Xi is doing this as individuals, not as states? Tariffs is like the worst solution to a problem, right? But we as individuals can have an impact, and if enough of us are individuals who care about freedom, we can have a big impact. Um, and why didn't China become free? So, because I believe, so China was on this path towards greater economic freedom and ultimately, I think, greater political freedom, and it reversed course under Xi it, since 2015. I think uh, China's reversed course because the West is so weak. Because they look at us and they say, we don't want to be like that, these weaklings. And, they, and really, the shift happened in China in 2008 during the financial crisis. They saw our politicians panic. They saw our markets crash. They saw that we all blamed it on capitalism. And I don't have time to tell you why it wasn't capitalism. But they blamed it on capitalism and said, we can't afford to be them. We don't want to be them. And the shift started in 2008 away from markets, away from freedom, and towards more of a nationalist, collectivist, authoritarian mode. Maybe that was the plan all along. But that wasn't a trend line pre-2014, 2015. So I think it's our weakness. I think most problems in the world are our weakness. I think uh, Ronald Reagan viewed America as a shining city on a hill. I think it never lived up to that. It could have been that, but it never lived up to that. It didn't live up to that after 9-11. It didn't live up to that in 2008. It's not living up to that today. Certainly Donald Trump didn't live up to that. Lived, you know, way below that. So there's no model. There's nothing for them to strive towards, to emulate. Um, so I, I think it's our weakness has driven China in that direction. And the only thing that can bring it back is our strength. And the more China becomes authoritarian, the weaker it will become. Authoritarianism leads to the destruction of innovation and progress and economic growth. Economic growth depends on freedom. Our philosophy, our ideas of freedom are right. They work. The bad guys don't work. They lose long term. They might take us with them, but they lose. Right, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we are going to have to call it there. Can we give a big round of applause to Dr. Yaron Brook, please?